when those big doors closed behind me, they were like the crack of doom. It was a terrible place. It was a real hell prison. Tom Jones, unemployed miner from North Wales, member of the International Brigade, wounded and taken prisoner September 1938. In jail in Bilbao, he faces his fascist interrogator. He said, what have you got to uh, say for yourself? Why did you come here? Oh, I said, I came to fight for democracy. Democracy, he said, that's a great pile of shit, he said, you know. Of course, I hadn't smelt fasses and anyhow. Uh, but uh, I didn't answer back. I just stood there to attention as well as I could. And uh, after I'd had a, an, another bath in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a pig barrel uh, with disinfectant in it, everybody had to go through that. Um, he had a look at my arm. He said, you're going to lose your right arm. And uh, anyway, he said, what was your job before you uh, came to Spain? I was a coal miner. He said, why didn't you tell me? I said, you didn't ask. Oh, I've got a tremendous regard for coal miners. I fought against the Asturian miners in the north, he said. And my God, did they fight. And whatever their views are on politics, he said, they're brave people. Nearly two years before, bound for Spain, Tom Jones had told his parents he was going to Colwyn Bay for the weekend. Now they were getting letters to say he was presumed dead. Death had claimed so many at the Battle of the Ebro. In the concentration camp at San Pedro de Cardenia, outside Franco's capital of Burgos, was the student son of a miners' union official, Morian Morgan. I failed to recognise any single person there. Everyone had had his hair shaved right off presumably to prevent the lice living in them. But it took me probably half an hour or so to pick out all my former friends. And there we were to stay for nearly a year. Uh, this monastery was built in 1610. It had then been the palace of the seed in Spain. Later it became a monastery and finally a concentration camp. It had three main floors and we were on the two upper ones, something like 500, I think, international brigaders. And then, in addition, there were 4,000 Spanish uh, prisoners as well on the other side. The conditions there were frankly appalling. First of all, we'd been switched very, very quickly from the hottest part in Spain to one of the coldest parts on the high plateau. And the temperature one Christmas was below zero. The b building was uh, had walls about three foot thick, intensely cold. The windows had no glass to them. And our only clothing was a shirt, thin trousers, and Spanish slippers, albergates. I was put in a corridor. There were no uh, uh, rooms for you. They were all full up. And I was given about uh, uh, 17 centimeters of space on the floor with uh, one blanket. It was a concrete floor. And then uh, everybody was sitting up killing lice. And I found within a couple of days I was covered in lice. They jump up on their hands, as it were, and wriggle their legs in the air. And then you'd actually see your own blood going into their mouths and in forming a little blob inside the transparent bodies. Then when you pick them off your body unconsciously, or for that matter, unconsciously from somebody else's body, you just squeeze them in your hand, and by the time you'd had a half an hour chat, your hands would be all bloody. And this habit be became so ingrained in people that if you're talking to somebody and you saw a louse walking on his body, you simply move out, take the louse and squash in your hands. And the habit became so ingrained that when subsequently I was back here in Wales, I was in a bus one day and the man in front of me, I thought, had a louse at the back of his head. And I went to pick it off my fingers but realized just in time it wasn't a louse but a simply a mole. There was only one tap for 250 people and one toilet. So there was a perpetual queue day and night to get to the facilities. And, uh, but, but the lice were uh, commandeering everybody's bodies. And if someone was ill, in addition to being, what you call, well, the, the lice seemed to multiply, and, and even the blanket they had over them was going up and down uh, with the number of lice, uh, the weight of lice, as it were, underneath and on top. Some people, I think, were driven mad by them. I remember one man particularly. He had visions every night of masses of battalions of lice in army formation, being led by their outriders and commanders, approaching him to attack. And he was so tormented by them that he was determined to capture every single louse in the building, and he kept them in a bottle. Later on, he did become mad, if he wasn't mad at that moment. And the worst part about the vice is this, that because we had no washing facilities, no soap provided, our bodies became filthy, 
and the lice then would bite and every bite would become infected. There was a hospital for ten people, but everybody that went in, they came out dead. It was that kind of prison. And beatings were uh, uh, the order of the day for the least offence. You were just beaten up and uh, any major offence, you didn't come back at all. Uh, we never knew where they got to. This car bears the name of one who disappeared in jail. The Communist Party sent greetings to its men at the front. They all signed it, including Jack Roberts, Jack Rusher, who remembers his mate, ex-mountain fighter, Tommy Boyo Picton. From the very first contact with Tommy, I felt that if Tommy was unlucky enough to be captured, he'd never come back alive, because he was not one of those fellows that would accept others giving him orders. And apparently that's what happened. He got shot, you captured, and uh, shot uh, as a prisoner. The Republican government, for which Tom Jones had fought, believed him dead and issued this certificate to confirm it. As far as the fascists were concerned, the sooner the certificate turned out to be true, the better. I was taken for trial on January the 2nd, 1939, and uh, I was charged with having come to Spain to kill Spaniards. I told them exactly why I came to Spain to fight. I didn't uh, cover anything up. I told them which fronts I'd been on and so on. So they estimated that uh, as I'd survived so long that I possibly would have killed a lot of Spaniards, you see. And uh, I had to reply to that, of course, and say I didn't come to Spain to kill uh, Spaniards. Uh, if any Spaniards were killed as a result of anything I did, well, they had weapons like I did and uh, possibly could do more of a damage. And I said, I've got the evidence on my arm and on my legs. Uh, the, um, they didn't like the trend uh, of my uh, answers. And the uh, prosecution asked for death sentence and the defending counsel asked for 30 years imprisonment. And I turned to him as a journal friend of mine because after you've been in those prisons for 12 months, uh, if you're not a physical wreck, you soon would be because uh, more than 10% of the prison population were suffering from skin diseases and uh, TB. For breakfast, we had uh, what is called garlic soup, which consisted of lukewarm water, breadcrumbs flavored with garlic. No f food uh, quality in it. Then for lunch, we'd have every day a ladle full of lentils, followed by two very salty sardines, and one small loaf of bread weighing about, say, three or four ounces. The same meal would be repeated then about seven o'clock in the evening, and that is our last meal. And how did Tom Jones feel as he heard himself being sentenced to death? I was too hungry to care, and uh, when I was uh, given the sentence, it didn't bother me in the least. I was looking at the clock, hoping I'd, I'd be back before six o'clock so I could get the evening cup of soup. Uh, because if you missed anything, you were terribly hungry, terribly hungry any, anyway. And hunger was a tremendous factor in the prison. Uh, and, but uh, it was lovely to go to sleep. I had wonderful dreams of feasts. Uh, the marvellous dreams. I don't know where they came from kind of thing, but uh, when I went to sleep, it was the happiest time in my life. I remember in one occasion I married my cousin, and uh, the uh, uh, wedding ceremony took place in Ross at uh, Bethlehem Chapel at the, uh, uh, in the vestry there, and it held 250. I remembered all these figures in my dreams. And uh, uh, the uh, wedding breakfast was laid out, and I could see the jellies and blancmange and everybody, and all the people I knew were all there. I thought I'll wait for them all to go, uh, go out after the breakfast is finished because they're bound to leave some of the jelly and blancmange over, and they did. And there I was, going around all these uh, uh, dishes with uh, jelly and, and eating uh, away there. And then you'd wake up to the unhappy reality. A broader unhappy reality brought about this great parade in Barcelona. Stalin was pulling out the international brigades. Two months before, in September 1938, he'd watched Chamberlain and Daladier hand over Czechoslovakia to Hitler. Clearly, he couldn't look to Britain and France for any real support against Germany. He began to stand his old foreign policy on its head, and in a year was to feign new friendship with Hitler. Amid a great new hooing and hawing about non-intervention, the brigades were withdrawn. They marched as though they'd been victorious. We marched through the center of the, the city. The crowd was wild with delight. Girls rushed out to kiss the international brigaders. Unfortunately, no one except a middle-aged man came out and kissed me. 
That was my reward. Thousands of those marchers had no homes, and many, like the anti-fascist Germans, had no countries to go back to. The Republic, though not by their going alone, was doomed. Standing next to me was an Irish boy, and this priest started to speak to us. I remember his first words were, Amano Mios, my brother's mine. After that, I lost the crux of it. I didn't know a lot of Spanish. But this Irish boy did, and he got rid of the real temper. And I said, What's the matter? So what is he saying? He just said, Tom, he said, my brother's mine. If I had my way with him, I machine gun the lot of him. And I said, as a priest of all things. Well, he finished his sermon, and afterwards I spoke to this, uh, uh, this Irish boy, and he broke down and cried. And he said, I finished him. I said, finished with what? Finished with religion, he said. I said, you are you're a Catholic, aren't you? The Catholic don't finish just like that. After what I heard the day, he said, I don't want no more to do with it, he said. No, I said, no, look, Paul, I'm not a goody good either in any way. I'm a churchman. He said, but don't throw your religion or your belief away because of one man. He's only a man. I said, your Christianity is a far bigger thing than what he is. Following the uh, death sentence, I was put in the death cells at Saragossa, and there were about 12 in a room. And uh, at dawn, on each morning, uh, one would be taken out. Sometimes they'd pass for a few mornings. But other cells, from the other cells, they would be taken out to be shot. And uh, we knew how many had been shot, because on the nights that people had been taken out, we used to be very much awake. And the sparrows would play on the uh, cell bars outside and on the... Uh, windowsill and uh, we used to watch the sparrows because that's the only object we uh, the only things we could see and uh, watch them copulating if you like and we used to count the number of times and they used to go up to 14 times uh, but when the uh, 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 volleys of uh, rifle uh, fire uh, as a result of shooting of the prisoners from the prison they, we used to be able to count the number of people that had been shot the sparrows would rise up off from the windowsill each time as they used to take the prisoners some distance from the prison, but obviously the sparrows could hear the shots, and they used to rise from the windowsill uh, so many times, sometimes five, six, to uh, up to twelve at a time. Well, you couldn't be shot when you wanted to. I had to. You had to wait your turn. So I was in death cells for about two or three months, and uh, I was li writing uh, letters from the prison on uh, uh, cigarette paper. Some of the prisoners were getting uh, food baskets in, and the labels would open, and they used to uh, put the uh, letters, uh, the uh, secret letters from prison in these handles and in these labels. They were wooden labels, and eventually one letter got home to say that I was uh, alive, that I was under sentence of death. And uh, then the British Embassy got busy, and uh, the campaign in the House of Commons, and they got my death sentence commuted to 30 years imprisonment. Uh, I was taken from uh, Saragossa to the penitentiary of Burgos to serve my 30 years. Uh, it was a better prison. Uh, it was a prison built for about 500, but there were 7,500 in it. Here, there were 600 people under the death penalty. And in the 12 months I was at uh, Burgos, the 600 were wiped out either by the firing squad or by garroting. And garroting is a terrible thing. The judge would order the man to be garroted once, twice, or three times. They sit you on a chair with a kind of wooden block at the back and turn the tourniquet on your neck. And when you were just about uh, to die, they don't screw it again. They do that two or three times. One of the prisoners in our cell was a rice farmer. He had been accused of killing 25 civil guards. Well, he was a tall man, a big man. And uh, uh, privately, I'd spoken to him. He'd never killed anybody. He was a successful rice farmer. But the local fascists were jealous of his success. 
and they uh, accused him of being a Republican supporter, and uh, there had been some killings there, and uh, they put the blame on him. So he was charged with all this, and the uh, morning they came to fetch him to, uh, to shoot him, he uh, made a speech in the cell, but he was such a dignified man, the guards didn't touch him, and I expected them to hit him, but they didn't. They used to hit the others with rifle butts, and uh, he, sh he shouted, down with the fascist Puccia Franco before going. Things were a bit different at the concentration camp in the Abbey at San Pedro de Cardenia, as Molly and Morgan remembers. The sergeants were a particularly vicious lot and seemed to get all their pleasure out of treating the prisoners. But all those people below the rank of sergeants were decent chaps, the guards and the corporals. There was one corporal in particular, a villainous looking creature. He was so ugly that when he was born, it said his mother would rather keep the stork. But he was the salt of the earth. Whenever any of our people were taken to the calaboose, which is a prison within prisons, where you slept without a blanket or mattress or food or water for five days, he always made a point of taking food and mattresses to these people. And later on, when we formed classes in the school, in, in the prison, he would then go into Burgos and buy all the equipment he needed, books and pencils and pens and chalk. And he also bought tobacco for us without making a profit for himself. Compelled to live in one single room month after month after month. We saw very rapid deterioration in the uh, sanity of the men there. So we decided to run as many classes as we could. Initially we formed language classes, teaching the simple elements of Spanish or English the case may be. And we utilized the experience and the situations we found in the camp. For example, when we dealt with verbs, we'd say, uh, for example, I am a prisoner, you are a prisoner, he is a prisoner, and so on. I have lice, you have lice, he has lice, she has no lice, and on and on like this. And then later on, we had more advanced classes. We had there with us about 50 people who were graduates of university, and then we had lectures on physics and chemistry, geography, economics, mathematics, uh, wireless telegraphy, architecture, the whole shoot. And this did help to stop what we called the demoralization of the people. At the outset, prisoners in San Pedro weren't allowed much communication with home. When mail started getting through from Britain, it brought cash, but often it brought, too, false hopes of early release. Uh, my people at home had a very, very close contact with the local MP who kept up a co contact with the, with the war office. And as a result, all the information that I got about our condition was actually factual. And very soon people got so fed up with these contradictory reports saying that we've been released in a month and we're still there after two months, that they then started disbelieving all these optimistic reports. And after a while, everyone was delighted when I got a letter, all the nationalities, and once they heard my name, they said, well, now we have a gem. Either we were stuck here or there's a chance of moving. And also, I think we had a lot of fun too from letters. There's one lovely story about one man, he had a letter from his mother saying, Dear Di, your sister's going to have a baby very soon. Hurry up and come home for the wedding. there were at least half a million dead, including an estimated 130,000 executions, about 75,000 on the Franco side and 55,000 on the Republican. Hugh Thomas, the historian, says, the great working class parties of Spain had been overwhelmed, along with their wild, generous and violent dreams. 300,000 Spaniards were to go into permanent exile thousands more to disappear in Franco's prisons. The Germans and the Italians went home for a few months before starting up the whole bloody roundabout again elsewhere. Tom Adlam was in a batch of prisoners exchanged for Italians. Someone asked, who's the oldest one here? Tommy Adlam. Tommy Adlam, 
take over, you the wet, take over in front. So I had to stand out now and give the orders, fall in. And all the boys fell in, told them, now look, we're marching out here with our heads up, chest out and our back straight. We come in with pride and we march out with pride. So they give orders, march off, and we started marching down the road. This man standing at the marching to the side of me. Next thing the boy start freaking out. There's a volley in Spain called an armor. And no passer on. And we sang all the way from that building till we was halted just at the edge of the bridge. And he handed some papers or something over. And then quick march and away we go. And as we passed over the bridge, everyone gave the Republican salute and shouted long live Spain and we were met halfway across the bridge by the French troops that was on guard the other side. And uh, that's our last day in Spain. It's fading. Names would escape me now, but uh, the memories of the faces are not fading as I saw them. I don't suppose I could envisage the children that I knew as adults, and the adults that I knew now are either very old or passed on dead. The one name I do remember is of a little girl, what should be about five, Pilar Heruela. She hung on to myself and Pat. So Pat and I now, he bought her a pair of shoes. She'd only been wearing the rope sole zapatos. Well, she was overjoyed. You thought that we'd give her the moon. Uh, that is the one child I think that I would remember, and remember her face as well as her name. I returned from uh, uh, Spain in April 1940. There had been a big campaign in Wales and in the House of Commons to get me released. Uh, but uh, Franco forces uh, wouldn't allow me to be released. But the Americans had started buying their prisoners. There were a few Americans. I was the last Britisher in the prisoners, as far as I know, in the prisons of Spain, and the last of the international brigaders. So that uh, the Americans had bought their people out. There was about five at the penitentiary of Burgos, and uh, they paid quite a bit of money for, to get them out. So that put the British government in a difficulty, and Franco was short of money. So what they'd done with the Americans, they'd sold these prisoners to the Americans. And uh, so the British government had to follow suit. Now, I was sold by Franco to the British government, and uh, the, uh, they paid, uh, or they gave a loan to Franco of two million pounds and a trade agreement. And on the day that was signed, I was released. I had to go and report back on the door. And uh, I had a lovely welcome with the, one of the clerks who opened the VA office in the territorials. And uh, said he was quite proud of it, quite proud of his boys. So I said, uh, look, uh, I come to sign on, yes. But look, by the way, I said, uh, I think there's some money owing to me. He, he looked at me strange. He said, what do you mean, Tom, money owing to? So I said, I think you owe me two days' door. You worked it out. I said, the week goes from Wednesday to Wednesday, didn't it? That's well, I said, uh, I got two days coming to me from the time I left England. Two years ago. And he said, no, no. And he said, quite right, too. I'll call the manager. When I got back to Rosan Rigog, I found that both my parents had uh, died in the meantime. And uh, they had received uh, a death certificate from the Spanish or Republican government, that is the side I was fighting on, to say I'd been killed in action. And they had uh, handed that certificate to the insurance company who'd paid out on it. They put the money in a drawer, and the money was there when I got home. So I came home to spend my own death benefit. In 1940, I was called up into the British Army. And later that year, at, when I was in Newmarket, I received a letter from the Foreign Minister, Lord Halifax, inviting me to repay the £12 it had cost the British government to bring me from Ripoll in Spain to London. I wrote back to him and said, Minister, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Asking a man who fought fascism in Spain and is now in the British Army doing the same, the same thing to repay a paltry 12 pound. I never heard another word. 
When I got back from Spain, uh, talking to people, they just didn't want to know. Didn't want to know anything at all about Spain. I was telling about the bombing. They told me they don't bomb people. I said, don't they? They don't bomb people. They bomb towns full of people. And I was disappointed and upset with everybody. And I said to myself, all these marvelous men I knew out there, nobody cares. I opted out of the whole situation from then on in. I didn't want to know. Before the countless wounds of Spain were opened, a young man from South Wales had a vision of how it would all end. He was a student here in the new University of Madrid. Now, as chorus to the story, Gwyn Thomas recalls how in 1934 he heard a captain in the Spanish army say this of the young and hopeful republic. Of course, it would have to be destroyed. I said, what do you mean, destroyed? Well, he said, uh, this present government, the system of ideas, will have to be destroyed. I said, you mean voted against? An obscenity, he said, voting, 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 destroyed, cataclysmically destroyed. Well, by what means are you going to agitate? Are you going to organize propaganda? Look at this. You see this? Insignia of the Spanish artillery, the guns that won South America will again regain Spain for the faith and traditional values. Now, I never heard this kind of language before in my life, you know. It was astounding. But this was it, you see. This was it in a capsule. This marvelous idea that if you have a hundred thousand people in a state organized in one small system of ideas and ideas based on a technology which is the technology of death you were onto a winner and so it proved that despite all these marvelous donations of love and valor from the four corners of Europe and the world it was that man sitting next to me in that table in Madrid who decided the issue. He knew precisely what he wanted, he knew precisely what he hated, and he won. <laughs>